Our outcome is I can explain the relationship among the concentrations of major species in a mixture of weak and strong acids and bases. So we're going to be looking at buffers, which are mixtures of strong and weak species. Buffers are solutions that contain components that allow the solution to resist changes in pH when small amounts of an acid or base are added. So here we have four different beakers representing different solutions. So we are going to label each reactant as strong acid, strong base, weak acid, weak base, and we're going to label our products as conjugate acid and conjugate base. Uh, for beaker A and B, we're going to fill in the rice uh, and riffs chart. Uh, the reason we have final here, we're dealing with a strong acid, so we don't have an equilibrium. Uh, but we do achieve some final state, so that's why we're using final there. And then for beaker C and D, we'll fill in the rice charts and we'll solve for our equilibrium concentrations. So starting with beaker A, which is 100 milliliters of pure water, and we're given the KW here for water. So water auto-ionizes, self-ionizes, meaning that water acts as both an acid and a base. So for example, if this water is acting as my weak base, that means that it's going to gain an H plus to form my conjugate acid. This water then must be acting as a weak acid because it is donating an H plus and hydroxide would be my conjugate base. Now in water, uh, our initial conditions, we're going to say that we don't have any uh, H3O plus or OH minus. And we know that the pH of pure water is going to be seven. So I'm going to gain 1.0 times 10 to the negative seven here and 1.0 times 10 to the negative seven here. So that means that at equilibrium, I have one times 10 to the negative seven H3O plus and one times 10 to the negative seven OH minus. So this would have a pH of seven. Now we're gonna take a look at beaker B, which is 100 milliliters of hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid is one of our seven strong acids. So that means that in this equation, water is going to act as a weak base. So my conjugate acid then is going to be H3O plus and my conjugate base is Cl minus. So we have one molar hydrochloric acid solution. So initially we're going to start with one molar HCl and no H3O plus and no Cl minus. And HCl is a strong acid, which means all of it is going to break apart. So I'm going to lose all one molar here. I'm going to gain one molar uh, H3O plus, and I'm going to gain one molar Cl minus. So at, e uh, at our final state, not at equilibrium, uh, I don't have any HCl. It's all dissociated to give me uh, H3O plus and Cl minus. So now looking at beaker C. Beaker C is a weak acid. HNO2 is not one of those seven strong acids, so it is a weak acid, uh, which means that in this case, water will be acting as a weak base. We form the conjugate acid H3O plus and my conjugate base NO2 minus. It's called a conjugate base because in the reverse reaction, uh, that NO2 minus can accept an H plus, making it a base. So looking at our initial concentration, our initial concentration is one molar HNO2. And we don't have any H3O plus or any NO2 minus. So I'm going to gain some amount here and some amount here which means I need to lose some amount here. So at equilibrium, I have one minus X, X and X. So now what we want to do is go ahead and solve for that concentration of H3O plus. So for beaker C, my Ka is going to be equal to 
my HNO3 plus times my conjugate base here, NO2 minus, divided by uh, my original concentration of my weak acid. So I can plug in my Ka value here, 4.6 times 10 to the negative 4, and that's going to be equal to x times x divided by 1 minus x. So to simplify this, we're going to use our k is small shortcut, which means that I'm going to simplify 1 minus x. If x is really small because k is small, then 1 minus x is pretty much just the same thing as x. So, or rather, it's the same thing as 1. So this simplifies our math here a little bit, where we can solve for x. So I get 2.1 times 10 to the negative 2. So going back to my beakers here, that means that at equilibrium, I'm going to have this, 1 minus the value of x, and x here is 2.1 times 10 to negative 2, and 2.1 times 10 to negative 2. So now we're going to do this one more time, but beaker D is a mixture of HNO2 and NaNO2. Now be careful here, the total volume is going to be 200 milliliters, so we actually have a dilution occurring here. Uh, we're basically doubling the volume, which means that we're going to have our concentrations here. So in this reaction, we have the same equation as we did for beaker C. Uh, it's just that there's two places where we're getting uh, NO2 from. We're getting NO2 from the NaNO2, and we're getting some from the HNO2 that dissociates. So we're starting with HNO2 acting as my weak acid. That makes uh, NO2 minus my conjugate base. Water is acting as a weak base here, so H3O plus is its conjugate acid. So the initial concentration of HNO2 is going to be 0.5. Because of the dilution, uh, we're doubling the volume, so we're having the concentration. There's no uh, H3O plus yet, because none of the acid has dissociated, but we do have some NO2 minus from the NaNO2. So to get to equilibrium, we know we're going to need to gain some on this side, which means I need to lose on this side. So I've got 0.5 minus x, x, and 0.5 plus x. So we're going to go ahead and plug all of these values into our K expression. So my K expression is the same as it was last time because we have the same uh, equilibrium reaction. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in the values that we have. We have 4.6 times 10 to the negative 4 for the Ka. Uh, and we have on top x times 0.5 plus x. And then on bottom, we have 0.5 minus x. So we're going to use our k is small shortcut again uh, to simplify this problem. So that gives me something that looks like this. So here, uh, 0.5 plus x and 0.5 minus x, as long as x is small because k is small, then 0.5 plus x is still 0.5, and 0.5 minus x is still 0.5. So this allows us to simplify this significantly, and we get that x is 4.6 times 10 to the negative 4. So I'm going to need to apply that in my table here. So 0.5 minus x, we're going to end up with pretty much about 0.5, not going to change much there. We're going to have 4.6 times 10 to negative 4 here, and we're pretty much still going to have 0.5 here. 
So if I wrote this out with adding in the value of x here, I would have 0 0.50046. So really not much of a change there in terms of concentration. So we're going to think about uh, adding some sodium hydroxide to each of these beakers. Uh, and we want to think about anything that's in the beakers that might neutralize sodium hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide is a strong base. So if there's any uh, weak acids or any strong acids, that would neutralize sodium hydroxide. So in beaker A, which is just pure water, there's nothing in there that's going to neutralize sodium hydroxide. Yes, water can act as an acid, but it's a very, very weak acid. So we're not going to see any degree of neutralization here. So as soon as you put one drop of that base into beaker A, the pH is going to shoot up. Beaker B has a strong acid in it. It forms H3O plus in solution. So if you put a drop of sodium hydroxide into beaker B, it'll get neutralized by the acid present in the beaker, and the pH is not going to change as dramatically. Beaker C, which is HNO2, this contains the weak acid, HNO2. So if there's a sufficient amount of that, then it would be able to neutralize uh, the sodium hydroxide as it is added. So if I put a drop of sodium hydroxide into beaker C, the pH isn't going to change much, just like in beaker B. Now in beaker D, remember that beaker D was a mixture of HNO2 and NaNO2. So this beaker also has the weak acid HNO2 that can neutralize added sodium hydroxide. So now we're going to look at the same beakers, but we're going to say, okay, what if we drop in one molar hydrochloric acid instead? So if we add some acid to water, there's nothing in water that's going to be able to neutralize that. So as I add this strong acid, uh, the pH is going to drop. As soon as I put a single drop of hydrochloric acid into beaker A, the pH is going to decrease dramatically. Beaker B is just more hydrochloric acid, so there's nothing in beaker B to neutralize hydrochloric acid. There's no bases in beaker B. Now in beaker C, we really don't have anything either. Now we could say, okay, technically we have NO2 minus, which is a weak base, but remember that HNO2 is a weak acid and it doesn't want to break apart. It's going to mostly exist as HNO2. So there's not really going to be any NO2 in the beaker that's able to neutralize uh, a strong acid as it is added. Now in beaker D, remember that beaker D has the same weak acid as beaker C, but it also contains sodium nitrate. Sodium nitrate is a soluble salt. So all of the sodium nit uh, excuse me, sodium nitrite, all of the sodium nitrite that you put into water is going to dissolve. So we'll end up with a lot of HNO2 and a lot of NO2. So beaker D, if you added some acid to it, the pH isn't going to change much because when you add that drop of acid to beaker D, the NO2 present in solution will neutralize it and so the pH won't change much. So a buffer solution is one that can neutralize small quantities of acid and base. This is possible because the solution contains both a weak acid and a weak base. The weak base is usually the conjugate base of the weak acid, allowing the solution to keep constant pH. So a good example could be acetic acid. And the conjugate base of acetic acid would be acetate. So we would get this from something like sodium acetate. We want to use something like sodium acetate because it will completely dissolve, completely dissociate, and Na is a neutral ion that will have no impact on pH. So we have an acid and its conjugate base. 
So which of these beakers contained the buffer? That would be beaker D. The weak acid was my HNO2, and my weak base is NO2 minus. So we have a conjugate acid-base pair here. Remember that the NO2 minus is not coming from HNO2. It's coming from the NaNO2, which is a soluble salt, which means it will dissolve and form lots of NO2 minus ions. Now, if I were to add some NaOH to the beaker, NaOH is a base, so it is going to react with my weak acid HNO2. Now, notice that in my reaction, I used a regular arrow. And that's because NaOH is a strong base. So as long as uh, there is excess HNO2, the NaOH will completely react. We will not have an equilibrium. Now, what if I were to add HCl? Well, HCl is going to react with my base, NO2 minus. And again, I have a regular arrow because HCl is a strong acid. We don't have an equilibrium. We have a reaction that goes to completion. Now I also want to point out, you might say, well, wait a minute, we formed a weak acid here. This weak acid does not want to dissociate to form H+. It has a pretty small Ka value. So there's no reverse reaction where we regenerate H+, and NO2-. So if we looked at our buffer system, Suppose you added one more milliliter of HCl than you had of base. The solution will become very acidic. Why is this the case? So when we've added our weak base, it's all been reacted uh, by that HCl. So when that last milliliter or that last drop of HCl is added, there's nothing left in the beaker that can neutralize it. So my pH will plummet and decrease very quickly. So we are going to look at this chart here, which has a bunch of different solutions. And we're trying to determine, is it a buffer or not? So we're going to start by determining all the ions that are present in solution. We're going to label uh, each as strong acid, strong base, uh, weak acid, weak base, or neutral ion. And then we'll state whether or not the solution is a buffer. So in our first solution, we have one molar HCl and one molar NaCl. So for strong acids and soluble salts, we tend to write those as dissociated ions. So I'm going to have H plus and Cl minus. Those are going to break apart in solution. And same thing for Na and Cl. I'm going to have Na plus and Cl minus. So uh, H plus here, uh, we're going to label this as strong acid since its source is HCl. And Na is what we call a neutral ion, and so is Cl. So these guys are all neutral and have no impact on pH. So is this a buffer? No. Next we have HNO2 and HNO3. So HNO3 is a strong acid, so I'm going to write that as dissociated. And HNO2 is a weak acid, so we're going to leave that together as HNO2. So I have my weak acid, I have my strong acid, and nitrate is another one of those neutral ions. Neutral ions are ones that come from any of the strong acids or strong bases. So any of the strong base cations and any of the strong acid anions are going to be neutral. And that's because they are strong species. They don't form any kind of equilibrium and they want to be dissociated. So these ions don't have any impact on pH. So my second solution, not a buffer. My next solution, I have ammonium chloride and ammonia. So ammonium chloride is one of those soluble salts. So this is going to give me ammonium ion and Cl minus ion. And then we also have the weak base NH3. So NH3 is my weak base. Now if you look at NH4+, that is the conjugate uh, of NH3. 
So this is actually going to act as a weak acid. And Cl minus is another one of those neutral ions. So is this a buffer? Yes. We have a conjugate acid base pair here, NH4 plus and NH3 minus. The next one, we have some acetic acid and some uh, sodium chloride. So acetic acid is a weak acid. So we're going to leave it written like this as associated together. So this is my weak acid. We're going to form Na plus and Cl minus, both of which are neutral ions. So this is not a buffer. The next one, we have HF and NaF. HF is a weak acid, so we're going to write it associated as HF. And NaF is a soluble salt, so we're forming Na plus and F minus. Na plus is a neutral ion. Now F minus is the conjugate base of HF. So we have both a weak acid and a weak base that are a conjugate pair in solution. So this one is a buffer. My next mixture is H2SO4 and Na2SO4. So uh, when uh, H2SO4 dissociates, we're going to get H plus and HSO4 minus. Uh, so sulfuric acid is unique in that the first H plus is strong, but the second H plus is weak. So I'm going to write it dissociated like this. I have my strong acid. I also have a little bit of this weak acid here. Now usually when we write this in solution we consider uh, H2SO4 to be strong acid. So there's really not going to be a lot of this HSO4 minus even though technically it is uh, you know, a weak acid here. So we're not really going to have a buffer system from this guy. Na is going to give us 2 Na plus, that's neutral, and SO4 minus 2 is going to be also neutral. So this is not a buffer. KOH will dissociate into K plus and OH minus. KCl will give us K plus and Cl minus. Uh, so uh, my OH minus is going to be a strong base. Potassium and chlorine are all neutral, so this is not a buffer. And in my last one, I have calcium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, all of which are strong species. So we have a strong base, strong acid, and then we have two neutral ions here. So these guys are just going to react together and neutralize. So this is not a buffer. So in question eight, we have some buffer systems and we want to determine the pH of these buffer systems. So what pH do they have? So starting off with beaker one here, which is uh, NH4Cl and NH3. This is a buffer system. So I'm initially starting with 0.5 molar over here. Uh, because we have the dilution going on where we're mixing 100 milliliters and 100 milliliters of one molar, the, we're doubling the volume, so we are having the concentration. So I don't have any H3O plus initially, but I do have some NH3. So I have both of those present. My NH4 is coming from the ammonium chloride, and my NH3 is just coming from my weak base. So we're not at equilibrium. In order to get there, I'm going to need to gain some here. I'm going to need to lose some here. Okay, so I can go ahead and solve uh, using my K is small shortcut. And when I do, I get that X is equal to 5.6 times 10 to the negative 10. So when I do the negative log of that, that 
the pH that I get here is 9.25. Now we're going to take a look at beaker 2, which is HF and NaF. So again, be careful that there is a dilution here because we are doubling the volume. So 100 milliliters of 0.1 molar HF, if you dilute it by half, you're going to have 0.5 molar. So we have HF from my weak acid. We also have F minus from this NaF. So I know I'm going to need to gain some here, lose some here. So these are my equilibrium conditions. And so I can go ahead and solve this guy using my Ka expression. And when I do, I get that x is 3.5 times 10 to the negative 4. So if I take the negative log of that number, my pH in this case comes out to 3.46. We got two more beakers to look at here. So again, we have uh, a buffer system here. We have H2CO3, uh, which is my weak uh, acid, and sodium hydrogen carbonate here is going to break apart to give me sodium and hydrogen carbonate. So initially, uh, we're going to have this 0.5 molar. So we're seeing a trend here because all of these are being diluted by 100 milliliters of another solution. Their molarity is being cut in half. So I need to gain some here and lose some here. So whenever I solve for x here, I end up with x is equal to 4.4 times 10 to the negative 7. So whenever I take the negative log of that, that's the concentration of H3O+. Plus. So when I take the negative log of this number, I end up with a pH around 6.36. Now beaker 4 is a little bit different. So in beaker 4, we have 100 milliliters of HF and 300 milliliters of NaF. So uh, the initial concentration for my HF is going to be uh, diluted by a factor of 4. So from 1 molar down to 0.25 molar. And for F minus, we're going to get 0.25 uh, from this guy but we're also going to get uh, 0.5 from this guy. So we end up with 0 and 0 0.750. So obviously we're not at equilibrium. We need to gain here, which means we need to lose here. And I can plug this into my equilibrium expression. And when I do and solve for x, the concentration of H3O+, plus, I get this guy. So if I take the negative log of 1.2 times 10 to negative 4, this gives me a pH of 3.93. Okay, so let's look at what we came up with for all of these different beakers. So do all buffers keep all solutions at a neutral pH? No. We saw some basic buffers and some acidic buffers. So depending on the components, the buffering zone can occur at different pH values, some acidic, some basic. Now in question 10, it says calculate the pKa by taking the negative log of the Ka. So when you see a P in chemistry in front of something, it usually means negative log. So I'm just taking the negative log of these numbers. And when I do that, these numbers should start to look familiar because they all match the pHs that I had for each of those buffer systems, except the last one doesn't quite match. So how are the pKa values of the weak acids related to the pH for beaker 1, 2, 3? 
So the pH is exactly equal to the pKa. When we have an equal amount of acid and base combined, so that's going on in beakers one, two, and three. When we have an unequal amount of acid and base, the pH is approximately the pKa. So in beaker two, my pH was 3.46. In beaker four, my pH is 3.93. And it's a little more basic in beaker four than beaker two because beaker four has a larger proportion of F minus from that sodium fluoride. So here are your reflection questions. What components are required to prepare a buffer? And compare the Ka for two weak acids, one with a pH of 2 and the other with a pH of 5.